Hello, and welcome to episode 113 of Design Curious Podcast. I'm your host and mentor, Rebecca Ward. Today on the podcast, I am attempting to give you a realistic view, or maybe it's just a discussion about the career of interior design. I realize that a lot of people jump into this podcast, have not gone back to listen to all of the episodes. And so you might not have heard me talk about the challenges of the career before, and that you kind of need to have a lot of grit in order to get into the field of interior design. It's not all rainbows and butterflies and everything you see on TV. So I'm going to talk more about that in the episode. So why don't we just get into it? You're now listening to Design Curious, a place where you, creative one, are here to learn about what it really is like to be an interior designer. And I'm your host and mentor, Rebecca Ward. If you're worried about how to succeed in a creative career, if you're ready to learn your next steps to become an interior designer, and if you want the satisfaction of doing something you love every day, you are in the right place. Grab a coffee, a notebook, and let's dig into today's episode. So like I said, the interior design career appears very glamorous. We kind of like it to look that way oftentimes on social media, on HGTV, because that's what looks the best. We're naturally inclined to present the best looking thing to our clients, to the world, because that's our job is to make things look the best they can be and to be beautiful and to be well designed. And so we want the products that we show to be looking good. And so what everybody sees is the best of the best, most of the time. I mean, you'll have behind the scenes and everything, but even those are curated. So I really wanted today to talk about the realities of the career, make sure that those who are thinking about getting into the career have a realistic expectations, just like I want my clients to have a realistic expectation of the jobs that we are going to be doing the projects that they are going to probably cost more and take longer than they would like or realize or had any idea could happen. (laughs) The same is true with the career of interior design. Some people listening to this podcast maybe came to it because of the name Design Curious. Yes, design enthusiast. They want to know if, hey, maybe I can do this as a career. I love going to home goods and filling up my shopping cart and then going home and staging my whole house. Yeah, that's great. Like that's the icing on the cake as far as the career goes. And uh, many people do make a living out of that, either professional stylists, which is in great need for photo shoots to have that styling and staging capability or professional stagers, which real estate people really need for selling the house. And so you can make a career out of that of just going to home goods and filling up a shopping cart and staging a house. But as you have probably learned, if you've listened to this podcast or any other interior design business podcast, that you understand that the career is a lot more than that. And like I just said, like it can be what you want it to be. But if you're going into thinking like, I'm going to be an interior designer, then you really need to understand what that name encapsulates. An interior designer has to do a lot of hard work, a lot of grunt work in the background. There are times you're going to be challenged left, right, and center by the contractor, by the client, and even your own doubts of whether or not you made the right decision on the job site. So what I'm trying to say is that it takes a lot of grit to be a designer. If you have not read the book Grit, I think you should by Angela Duckwork. (laughs) It's a great book. I read it uh, with the idea of learning some things about parenting, which is very great in there. But also just for everyday life, you need grit to get through all the tough times. And so Let's talk a little bit more about what is challenging about interior design and what kind of deep work you need to do to make sure that you're on the right path to be an interior designer. So I think that even myself starting out in the career, 
had maybe a glamorous idea of what I would be doing once I graduated and be working, you know, I thought maybe I'd be working for another firm and doing some restaurant design or lighting design, reflected ceiling plans all the time. And I'd just be, you know, kind of working in the background. I didn't initially think that I was going to own my own business or even do residential design because I think, you know, especially going through a four-year degree at Sacramento State University, which is much more commercially focused, that I kind of was leaning towards commercial design when I first came out. But then I ended up getting a job for a model home designer. So that put me firmly in the residential design experience. And so I, you know, soon took to it very well. And that's all I do now (laughs) is residential design. But I definitely learned that when I was doing model homes, There is a lot of hard work to do. A lot is writing on your drawings that if you make a mistake, you might have to pay to fix it. (laughs) And so just keep that in mind as you're owning your own business. You definitely want to have a cushion in the background for making mistakes. Of course, if it's a serious mistake, that's what your insurance is for. But oftentimes it might be couple hundred dollars up to a couple thousand dollars that you need to throw at a mistake that you made to make it go away or to correct it. So that is a challenge. (laughs) Money is always a challenge. But also being questioned about your decisions, the design decisions that you make, you need to defend them sometimes. You need to stand your ground and make sure that you can defend your design, which you believe is the best solution for the client, to maybe a doubting contractor or a electrician who's been doing it for 30 years and said, well, I've never done it this way before. And just because he hasn't done it that way before doesn't mean, or that's the way he's always been doing it, doesn't mean that's the way he should continue to do it. So before you start the career, I would suggest you sit down and take out a journal and start writing your personal story about what has led you to this point where you want to be a designer. What are some obstacles that you anticipate facing? What is the mindset that you need to have to overcome these obstacles and these hurdles? Such as, you know, if you are struggling to get new clients, how are you going to feel at that time? What are some solutions? Are you just going to sit there and kind of feel sorry for yourself? Or are you going to be proactive and go out there and start networking or maybe pivot your niche and start working in another area? As a designer, especially when you're owning your own business, you need to be very flexible, looking for opportunities all the time. But yeah, do some soul searching, some self-assessment, understand you, understand what you're good at. Obviously, you're probably good at being creative and coming up with a design. But are you also good at the accounting part, the spreadsheets? Or are you good at writing down all of the finishes that you selected and making sure you have the grout colors in there? How detailed are you? So if you're not very much and you know this about yourself, then you're going to need to align yourself with someone else who can help you with this work. And maybe this is also applicable for those who want to go and work for another designer or for a design firm. Like you need to know where your strengths lie and where you can experience more growth. (laughs) But you want to be in your zone of genius for your employer or for your business as a designer. Maybe your zone of genius is doing the CAD drawings. You could just sit there for five hours and draw away and that's where you love to be, then that's great. Then you know that's what you're really good at. You're going to need to bring in someone else who can start to pull together all the soft finishes or you know something else that maybe is not your, your forte in design. So what you're going to do once you've kind of done this deep work of really doing soul searching, what do you like doing? What do you not like doing? What is it that you love about design? Do you have realistic expectations of the career? Like, have you done your research? Have you talked to different designers? I run a local design group that is uh, gets together to talk about our businesses. And it really is like a support group for each other. You know, if we're having trouble with submitting plans to the building department and this particular plan check person is giving us trouble, like 
we talk about different solutions that we found or, you know, steer clear of this client if they decide to reach out because they've just been a nightmare and they're going through designer after designer, you know, or a project or, you know, maybe there was a problem on the job that they had to throw money at. And so we can all learn from their mistake and not make that on our own project. So really getting a support group around you is going to be a major help getting a mentor, like getting into my mentorship program, or getting a coach who can really ask you the tough questions and help you do a little more deep work and mindset work around your career. So another thing that I love to do, because I love growth, if you haven't found that out about me already, it's one of my core values is growth and learning and everything. So I'm always buying books and listening to books about these types of things. And so I've mentioned Grit. I've mentioned before Start With Why by Simon Sinek. I actually have a whole list of books that you can reference on Amazon of things that I recommend to people going through my mentorship program and also just for other designers in general. I think it'll be useful. There's business books, there's personal discovery and leadership books in there as well. So that is another thing to lean into when you're looking to start a new career. Of course, there's apps and tools that you're going to need to learn. So how good are you at learning new software, new programs? How flexible are you with change? I think few of us really love change, but we know it's challenging. But we also know it can be good, especially if you have the right mindset. You can pivot almost anything to your advantage. And then, of course, there's a lot of online communities. I just put a word of caution that sometimes you're not always going to get the best advice just from a Facebook forum, but it is interesting to go in there to see what other people are struggling with. A lot of people talk about it. There's a lot of Facebook communities and things like that that you can lean into to really discover the career. The whole point of this podcast is that I want you to go into it with eyes wide open And understand that most of the time, an interior designer is a problem solver. We are faced with challenges and we are trying to find solutions to that problem. So if you like facing challenges and finding solutions to problems, then you will probably have what it takes to be successful in the career. It is the fluffy you know, selecting finishes, putting them together and presenting them to the client is just like 20% of the job. And rarely do we get to do just all that fun part. And like I said, it's just the icing on the cake for what we do. But I personally really enjoy being a problem solver. And so that's why I'm still here almost 20 years later, designing for residential clients. So if you think you can do the hard thing and be a designer, which is a challenge, which is why we need to be paid well. I'm just going to drop that in there because we do a lot of really hard things that is invisible to most people. Talk about invisible labor. I don't know if you've heard that term before. Oftentimes it will describe the work that maybe a woman does in the household compared to in a standard household where they're you know, both partners are working, usually the woman will take on a lot more responsibilities and does a lot of invisible labor that most people in the house are not aware of. I think the same is true for interior designers, largely in part because we are women, (laughs) that we will take on a lot of responsibilities and not complain about it or not even vocalize or share online what we're doing because that's not the glamorous part. It's not the fun part. So just be aware, there's a lot of invisible labor with interior design. (laughs) I hope you're not dissuaded (laughs) about the career. I just want you to be realistic. Like I said, I really do enjoy being an interior designer, and I really enjoy all of the challenges that come with it. I hope that you are the same way, but if you know yourself, if you've done the deep work and done a lot of self-discovery and you know that you're not up for the challenge, then perhaps you need to pivot and look at other things that you could do. Like I said, you can be a professional stager, you can be a stylist, or you know maybe there's some other avenue that you can go into working with retail or something like that. 
that might not include all of those challenges and invisible labor that I discussed in the episode. All right, so if you are still interested in being an interior designer, but you would like a mentor, someone like myself, to help give you feedback and help you learn what I've learned and understand what the career is really like, talk to me one-on-one, then you will want to get into my design mentor. Check the links in the show notes, as well as all the downloads that are there for you. That's all I have for this week. Next week, I'll have another great episode. And until then, stay creative. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode, please leave a rating and a review. This helps me reach other curious creatives like you. If you have a topic request or would like to contact me, simply head over to my website, rwarddesign.com or email me at podcast at rwarddesign.com.